Freedom. It's something we cherish in this country. The idea of a free society is embedded into the very core of our nation. Many have died defending it, and many have fought diligently to preserve it. So where has it gone? We've become a nation bound by division, chained by hatred, and consumed by selfishness. There's an epidemic of violence, poverty, brokenness. Does this look like freedom? The Bible tells us we're called to be free, but it also says to use that freedom to serve one another humbly, in love. Maybe that's what we're missing in America. Today, we celebrate Independence Day. Perhaps it's time we recognize that true independence is found only in a lasting dependence on God. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Hey there, Converge Nation, Pastor Ray here, and I'd like to uh, invite you to be a part of all that God is doing right here at Converge. And one of the ways you can do that is by getting the word out. A word of mouth is the most effective, most reliable marketing tool. There's a lot of things we do on social media, a lot of things we do uh, virtually, a lot of things we do electronically, 
Uh, but your word of mouth, listen, makes a difference because what you're doing is you're personally offering your endorsement of what we're doing here at Converge. So we ask you, listen, share the message. Every Sunday, whether you're in person or uh, 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 virtual, when that message goes live, click that share button. Uh, if you're on social media, if you're on IG, you're on TikTok, whenever we post, we ask you, we invite you to share the message, share the post with a friend. We want that organic reach uh, to begin to impact people, not just in our city where we serve, not just in our city where we're planted, but uh, your friends and your network to receive the same kind of ministry, the life-giving ministry that's happening here at Converge Church. Also, you can do a check-in to let people know when you're here at Converge, and it just helps us organically, the way the numbers work with, uh, with uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Y'all know what I'm talking about. The, the algorithms, there it is, the algorithms. So all of that makes a difference. And uh, so thank you for partnering with us because this is truly a partnership when you share. We're also on version, so make sure if you're not here, man, follow along on version. The notes are there. Uh, the information will be on the screen for how you can access all of our notes on version. But stay connected, not just in person when you're here, but even virtually by sharing what God is doing right here on all of your social media platforms. God bless you as we're about to go into today's message as we continue our sermon series, Ghost Stories. <laughs> Well, good morning, Converge Nation, and welcome to week five of our sermon series, Ghost Stories. Uh, as you know, uh, we are not meeting in person this weekend, so we're honored uh, that you've chosen to prioritize our online broadcast today. We trust that something we say, something we do will minister life and encouragement uh, to you this morning. Wherever you are, the cabin, camping, uh, at the lake, or maybe in the comfort of your own home with friends and family, we'd like to say welcome to Converge Online. We're gonna dive into the word momentarily, but we wanna honor you and say, listen, we hope and we pray that you have a fantastic, safe, life-giving, fun 4th of July. Uh, with the ones that you love. Let's pray and we'll dive into the word together this morning. Father, we love you. We honor you. And we thank you, Lord, for this day that you have made. Lord, we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. And Lord, we thank you for everything this weekend represents as we draw near to the 4th of July. Father, I thank you that your word declares it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So as we celebrate Independence Day nationally, God, we also celebrate and acknowledge the independence, the freedom, and the liberty that we have in Christ. God, I commit this service to you. Every word we say, I pray that it will minister life to the hearer in Jesus' name. But beyond just hearing, God, we ask that you would make us faithful doers of the word. For it is in the hearing of your word that faith comes, but it is in the doing of your word that our lives are transformed and we see the fruit of everything you've instructed us to do. We give you the glory, we give you the honor, we give you the praise for it. Now, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. As I mentioned uh, a moment ago, this is week five of our sermon series, Ghost Stories. We've been walking through God's word and examining the chronicles of the acts of the Holy Spirit, the works of the Holy Spirit in the life of the early church and also in the life of the believer. Remember, Philippians chapter 2 says it this way, that God is at work in us, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. That means right now in your life, in the life of every Christ follower, every believer, the Holy Spirit is actively at work to do two things, both to will, to cause us to do two things, both to will and to do. He gives us the will the desire 
to do the Father's good pleasure. And that's good news this morning because here's, here's our anchor text uh, for today's message, which if I were to choose a title for today's message, it would simply be free to be me. Come on, somebody. It is Independence Day, and I believe that the Lord wants to remind us. The Lord wants to inform us, and he wants to encourage you to let you know that you are free to be you. Now, let me qualify that. Free to be me in our context as Christ followers doesn't mean that you're free to do whatever you want. That's what culture says, right? If it makes you happy, then do it. No, 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 no. Free to be me means that you are free to be and become all that God has planned and purposed for you to be. Free to be me means I bring my life into alignment and submission to God's plan and God's purpose for my life. You know why? Who you are is not for you to decide, it's for you to discover. Because God decided that a long time ago. It is God appointed, not self assumed. So this Independence Day, when we say free to be me, let me be crystal clear. We're not telling you to ad-lib the script. We're not telling you to become something that is different than God's design and plan for your life. We're saying today is an opportunity to be reminded of God's original design, God's original purpose, God's original plan for your life. And in discovering that, and in developing that, and in deploying that, you and I begin to experience the freedom that God, through Christ Jesus, purchased on the cross. Listen, I, I just dropped a lot on you. We're going to unpack that as we move through this message and show how all of this, everything I just said, is connected to the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer and every Christ follower. Somebody say, that's me. Come on, drop that in the chat. That's me. Amen. Amen. Here we go. Here's our anchor text as we look to God's word. And as you know, we are sticklers for the word of God here at Converge. It informs everything we do. We are a gospel-shaped community of faith where Jesus is exalted where people matter. Come on, people matter to God. So people matter to us. Amen? But we also point people to their purpose. And that's why those three things are prioritized here at Converge. Jesus, and that's why we preach the gospel. We elevate Jesus. We magnify the person of Jesus. Number two, we love people well. And we point them to their purpose. That is where that convergence happens for us. Our anchor text this morning is lifted from 2 Corinthians. This is Paul's second letter to the, to the church at Corinth. And he's responding to some very specific things in the church at Corinth. This time around, as we pick up the narrative in chapter 3, Paul is talking about the difference between the glory of the old covenant and the glory of the new covenant. And he uses a lot of metaphors to describe what was happening when Moses went up to Mount Sinai and God revealed himself and God showed his glory to Moses. In fact, after this divine encounter that Moses had with God, when he came down to the people, to the nation of Israel uh, uh, at Mount Sinai, his face shone with the glory of God to such a degree that he had to cover his face with the veil. Paul in this writing is saying, if God revealed his glory to Moses and through Moses in such a powerful and profound way under the old covenant, how much more does God desire to reveal his glory to us and through us under the new covenant? And he's saying that the veil is no longer necessary we don't need to cover up. In fact, what he's saying is that you and I need to be a reflection of his glory everywhere we go and in everything we do. 
So that is just a summary of chapter 3. We're going to pick up in verse number 17 because I think verse 17 uh, is, is apropos as we unpack this idea of what it looks like to be free in Christ, to be free in him, free to be me as God has purposed and intended. Notice verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, now the Lord is the spirit. Come on, somebody. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. There is independence. No longer bound, no longer held hostage, no longer incarcerated by my past, by my bad decisions, no longer a slave to sin. Notice, ghost stories, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Holy Spirit comes. He abides with the believer to bring us to a place of liberty, to a place of freedom, to a place of victory. Now the verse continues, but we all with unveiled face. Remember, Moses had to cover his face with a veil because the glory of God was so bright, emanating not only from his countenance but from his person, so much so that the nation of Israel, two million people, couldn't look at Moses. Paul is saying he's contrasting what was happening with Moses, and he says for the believer, you and I can live with our faces and our lives unveiled, uncovered, Beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Come on, that's good news this morning, Converge Nation. In fact, right there in the chat, why don't you drop some fire emojis uh, because we're going to unpack what Paul just wrote. Number one, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And the fact is, you and I are conduits. You and I are vessels that carry the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, our portion in life is not that we live in bondage, that, not, that we not live incarcerated. We live free, independent. We elevate and we rise above anything and everything that would try to hold us captive in Jesus' name. Number two, he says, we behold as in a mirror the glory of God. What does, was, what does a mirror do? A mirror casts a reflection of what's standing in front of it. And what Paul was saying is that when you and I, when we stand in the presence of God, what God reflects back to us is an image that's not imposed on us by culture, that's not imposed upon us by what we've been told, it's not imposed upon us by our experiences, our exposure, and our expectations. The reflection that we see in this mirror is a reflection of who God created you to be and everything God intended for you to become. So number one, number one, there's freedom. Number two, as we look to God, just as Moses had this encounter with God, God reveals our original identity in him. And notice what the scripture says. It's transformative. No one who encountered Jesus walked away the same. No one who experienced Jesus walked away un changed. And so this morning, God's word of encouragement to you is that as you look to him, as you run to him, as you return to him, here's the word, you are transformed, notice what it says, into the same image. Come on, somebody. When we look to Jesus, when we look to him, the scripture says we are not transformed into something else, into something different. We're transformed into the same image that we look upon. Here it is. Here it is. Truth bomb. Get ready. 
you become what you behold. I'll say that again just in case you missed it. In fact, drop that in the chat. You become what you behold. And the problem is the reflections that we're entertaining in our lives are coming, come on, from distorted mirrors. We're looking at the wrong things. And when you look at a distorted mirror, if you've ever been to a, a, a fair, if you've ever been to an amusement park, and you've looked at the distorted mirror, it's going to do one of two things. It's going to give you an inflated sense of yourself. It'll make you a lot taller, a lot bigger than you are. Or if you look at certain mirrors, the reflection back to you is going to give you a deflated reflection because the mirror is distorted. And the problem with most people is that they've spent their lives looking for for identity, looking for value, looking for meaning in distorted mirrors that have been giving them a distorted reflection of who they are. Yet the scripture says, come on, that you are free to be you because the spirit of the Lord, wherever he is, there is liberty and there's freedom. And when we behold, when we look and we set our gaze upon God, the reflection that we get is the same image the same God identity that we see in Christ. Notice that verse. Notice that verse. We are transformed. That word is the word we get metamorphosis, the way where we get the word metamorphosis. God wants to do a transformative work in you. He wants to do a work that is akin to the metamorphosis that a caterpillar experiences, where if we will allow him, if we will allow Holy Spirit not only to initiate the work, but to complete the work. He will do something so transformative that there will be absolutely no trace of what you once were. There's no way you can look at a caterpillar without observing the life cycles of a caterpillar and say, yeah, that came from that. God wants to do something so radical. Come on, something so transformative that when people see you, there is absolutely no trace of what you've been through. The scripture says that there were four men, four men in the fire. He said, well, hold up. Didn't we throw three in? But I see a fourth man that looks as the son of God, uh, looks like the son of God. And when they brought them out, the scripture says that God brought them out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the fiery furnace. And they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. Listen to me. God is bringing you into a season where there will be no trace ha, of what you've been through, no trace ah, of what the enemy tried to do to you. You know why? Because he's transforming you from caterpillar to butterfly. Now, let me tell you where most of us give in. Let me tell you where most of us give up. It's in the middle. Because in the middle, and if I remember my science right, that caterpillar, incubates in a chrysalis, a cocoon. And that does, only does it incubate, listen to me, Converge Nation, it is suspended upside down. You may be a season in your life, Converge Nation, where you have lost your orientation. You've lost your footing. Everything in your life seems to be upside down. But God says, you're only in the middle, baby. And not only that, listen, 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 there's complete and utter darkness complete and utter darkness, suspended upside down, can no longer do what it used to do, no longer crawling, no longer moving. Yet the Lord says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And you say to yourself, Pastor Ray, what I'm going through right now doesn't look anything like liberty. Yet the Lord says, baby, you're only in the middle. Right now, where you've lost your orientation and everything seems dark and everything seems uncertain, Listen, it's only a part of the process because the next part of this process, if you will stay the course, if you won't throw in the towel, if you won't quit prematurely, if you won't grow weary in well-doing, here comes the butterfly. Here comes the butterfly. I always marvel at the fact that a caterpillar has all these tiny legs and still can only do so much. Yet after he goes through this transformation and this metamorphosis and becomes a butterfly, Oh, my goodness. He has two wings. Not a, I don't know how many legs caterpillars have. I was already thinking about millipedes and centipedes. I know that's a hundred legs, a thousand legs. I don't know how many legs a caterpillar has. But you know what God's saying? 
When you go through this process, you will be able to do more with less. You had to crawl slowly at like a caterpillar, turtle type pace when you had all these legs. But if you'll just let my process run its course, come on somebody, I will transform you from a caterpillar into a butterfly and you will begin to soar. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? Come on, Converge Nation. If you pick it up, what Pastor Ray is putting down, drop something in the chat right now. Come on, somebody. Now, listen, Converge, that was only my introduction. We're about to get to the word now. Glory to God. Let me read the text one more time for you. And let me tell you why this is critical. Uh, let me tell you why this is so important. Uh, in psychology... There is a phenomenon called padding. Um, and it, it, it manifests usually, and I want to be sensitive and respectful, but it manifests usually in women who have been impacted by some type of physical trauma, physical abuse, and or sexual abuse. And what padding is, it is this unexplained weight gain where psychologically the body begins to say, if you put on more weight, you'll be safer. If you pad yourself, nobody will be able to hurt you again. And there are women, certain women especially, who experience this phenomenon called padding. I wonder though, Converge Nation, how many of us unconsciously, unknowingly, unintentionally, have padded ourselves emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually to cope with what life has thrown at us. The violent and fierce blows of life that have caused us to pad ourselves. May I submit to you that when we pad emotionally and psychologically, it shows up as layers. And maybe what God wants to do this morning with this message, free to be me, is to help us peel back some layers. The padding, intentional or unintentional, that we have used as a coping mechanism to protect ourselves from being hurt again. Let's talk about some of those layers. This list is by no means exhaustive, but it helps us understand how sometimes, instead of turning to the mirror of God that reflects our true identity, we turn to distorted mirrors of our own making. And the reflection back to us Is distorted. Uh, let, let, let's talk about some of these layers. Intentional or unintentional, conscious or unconscious, that keep us bound. And again, this is <laughs> Independence Day weekend. The Lord says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom. Liberty. Free to be me. Here it is. We're going to peel back some layers. Uh, layer number one. And we talked about this last week with the imposter syndrome. We've gotten so much feedback, so much feedback on how this message has impacted people. In fact, I got a call this morning from one of our viewers uh, 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 online who doesn't even live in Texas who called and said, Pastor Ray, I need to talk to you about this because this is where I am right now. Had no idea that so many people would not only be impacted, but experience freedom because of that message. Will the real you please stand up? We talked about this last week, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. But the first layer that we use to pad ourselves when we experience trauma, 
emotional, physical, spiritual, the first layer that we use, here it is, the me I pretend to be. Yeah. Uh, I describe this layer of padding as the me in all of us that wears the mask, the public facade of success that often covers the private failure. It is the me that I pretend to be because if I let people really see this part of me, would they still love me? Uh, One of of the greatest revelations uh, I have not only understood but also experienced is that most people love you based on what they don't know about you. Oh, let that sink in for a second. Yeah, most people love you. Most people like you based on what they don't know about you. And because we understand that, we say to ourselves, I can't let people know that about me because if they did know that about me, would they still love me the same? Oh, man, the good news this morning is that you can be free to be you because our God loves you. Not because of how perfect you've been, but in spite of your imperfections. I love the way Rick Warren put it. Rick Warren, the lead pastor of Saddleback Church, one of the most influential churches in the world. He first gave us the Purpose Driven Church, and then he followed that up with the best, I think it's at one time was the best-selling book in the world after the Bible, The Purpose Driven Life. This is what Pastor Rick Warren said. He said, if you'll clear the skeletons from your closet, the ghost of your past will stop haunting you. Don't repress it. Confess it. Whew. Just in case you missed that conversion nation, I'm going to read that one more time again. If you'll clear the skeletons from your closet, the ghosts of your past will stop haunting you. Don't repress it. Confess it. And that's why in James chapter 5, uh, James gives us this prescription for healing uh, as believers. He says, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders. They'll lay hands upon him and anoint him with oil, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. If there's any happy among you, let him sing. But then he goes down to the very next verse, I believe it's James chapter 5 and verse 16, the A portion of that verse. And he says, confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Where, where, Where does healing come? We pray to God vertically for forgiveness. We confess our faults one to another to be healed. The healing comes when we take off that first layer of padding. And that first layer is the me that I pretend to be. To have people in my circle, people in my world with whom I can be vulnerable. That after I have confessed my struggles or my shortcomings, here's what they're going to do. They're not going to broadcast it. They ain't going to run tell that. The scripture says, confess your faults to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. You know where liberty happens? You know where freedom happens? It happens when I'm willing to confront that first layer, and that is the me that I pretend to be. And most of us are haunted by the ghosts of our past because we're unwilling to clear the skeletons out of our closet by taking off the mask. Uh, Layer number two, layer number two. The me (laughs) I think (laughs) I should be. The me I think I should be. (laughs) This is sort of the poser version, right, uh, or, or, or the aspirational version of us, which, again, aspiration is not bad. But listen, people have always said, you can be anything you want to be if you put your mind to it. No, no, I, 
I don't know if that's entirely true from a biblical standpoint. So what Pastor Ray's scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Absolutely. But Christ will only give you strength to do the things that he created and called you to do. Nothing else. His strength doesn't come to us in disobedience. His strength comes to us in our obedience. And that's why Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 19 says, if you would be willing and obedient, you going to eat the good of the land. It's twofold, baby. If you're first of all willing, that speaks of an attitude that is etern- internal. If you're willing and then obedient, the action. The attitude, willingness, precedes the action, obedience, and then we eat the good of the land, the fat of the land. God's strength, God's grace comes upon us to do what he called and created us to do, not just what we want to do. And so the second layer is the me that I think I should be. Hmm? God's created you and gifted you to be one thing. But in your mind, the grass seems so much greener over there. So that's what I choose to do. It's the ear wishing it was the eye. It's the eye wishing it was the head. It's the hand wishing it was the foot. And the eye says, man, you get to see all this beautiful stuff that I only get to hear about. And the eye saying to the ear, oh, man, if you only knew all the pain that I see as well. And then the eye saying to the ear, well, I wish I could hear all this beautiful music. And the ear says, man, I hear beautiful music. I hear beautiful poetry, but man, if only you could hear what people are saying to each other, about each other, and against each other. You see, the truth is, the grass often seems greener on the other side. And that's one of the reasons we pad ourselves with the me we think we should be. When life is often a two-sided coin. And most people are unwilling to take the bitter with the sweet right where they are. So they try to exchange the life God gave them for the life that impresses them the most. And we pat ourselves. And God says, listen, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, free to be me. You don't have to pretend. And you don't have to aspire to be something you're not. Because when you're willing to just rest in who God created you to be, that's where true freedom and liberty happens. Uh, Notice the words of Jean Vanier. He said, envy comes from people's ignorance of or lack of belief in their own gifts. Yeah, (laughs) come on somebody. And that's why last week I said, don't let your food get cold looking at somebody else's plate. And the reason we envy others is because we are either ignorant of or we lack a belief in what God has already given us, what we have, what the eye does versus what the ear does. And we forget, if I'll let the eye just be the eye, and if I'll just be content being the ear, then the whole body works the way it's supposed to. The problem is, when you got eyes trying to be not, not being eyes, you got ears not being ears, what happens then is one has to compensate for what the other isn't doing. When one person isn't standing in their gift, now the whole body has to compensate for what one is deficient in. You already know that people who have vis- challenges visually or with their visibly, vis- uh, visibility have to adjust their hearing. 
to make up for what they can't see. And the truth is, because some in the body are unwilling to do their part, others have to adjust and overcompensate because somebody is not embracing the me God created them to be. Is this helping anybody this morning? Come on, drop some bombs in the chat. Let me know that I'm talking to you this morning. I got to move along. I got to move along. Hey, here's the other one. Y'all ready for this? The third layer. <laughs> ah, the third layer uh, is, is pretty diabolical <laughs> because the third layer is the me that other people want me to be. And this layer of padding that keeps me from being my true self often happens at an early age. It usually happens in the context of the nuclear family where a parent tries to live their life vicariously through their children. Well, your grandfather was a doctor. I'm a doctor, so you're going to medical school. Well, Dad, I'm a creative. I want to work in the theater, and I want to be a songwriter. Come on, Billy Elliot. Y'all remember the movie Billy Elliot from England? I think they were from Liverpool, and he came from a hard-nosed, blue-collar family that worked in the coal mine, but Billy Elliot wanted to dance, y'all. And there are some of us who are living the life that somebody else chose for us, not the life you chose for yourself. <laughs> the first movie that Levi fell in love with, he was probably about two, two years old, was Happy Feet. And Happy Feet uh, is the story of this penguin who didn't have a heart song because the way that penguins mate is uh, the male will sing a song, and if that song resonates with the female, it'll attract the male and the female, and they fall in love. In, in Happy Feet, Mumble was dropped. Come on, somebody. Ooh, I could preach that. Before he hatched. And it left him with this impediment where he couldn't sing. So he became the laughing stock of the entire penguin colony. But what Mumble could do what he couldn't do with his voice. Come on, somebody. Mumble could do with his feet. And I still remember Levi would stand, I mean, inches from the television screen. And when Mumble started to dance, y'all, come on, somebody. <laughs> when Mumble started to dance, Levi, two years old, started to get his boogie on, man. And nobody appreciated Mumble until one day, they realized they didn't need his voice. What they needed was his feet. And there are some people in life who will try to suppress the greatness of God in you and try to convince you to exchange what God called you to do for what they want for you. We talked about King Saul last week. But remember... <laughs> King Saul stood head and shoulders above every other person in Israel. Yet when he was confronted and challenged by Goliath, and when the nation of Israel was taunted, listen to me, when you read the story, 1 Samuel chapter 16 was taunted for 40 days, the entire nation, and no champion came from the nation of Israel except David. Guess what scaredy cat Saul did? Scaredy cat Saul, after David said, I, listen, the Lord will give me this victory. You know what scaredy cat uh, uh, Saul said? You know what, David? If you're going to fight, if you're going to fight Goliath, you're going to need my armor. And notice what the scripture says. David put on Saul's armor, but he took it off. Aye, because it didn't fit. What worked for them may not work for you. What worked for Saul may not work for David. And you have to be confident.
confident enough as you peel off this layer and say, I ain't going to live the life you chose for me. I will start to live the life that God ordained for me. And guess what David did? He took off Saul's armor. Makes absolutely no sense. Why are you going to fight a giant with a sling and a stone? You're going to fight that giant with a sling and a stone because that's what God gave you. Because that's what God gave you. Because that's what God gave you. And maybe there's someone watching this broadcast right now. And he said, Pastor Ray, I've, I lived my whole life in the shadow of Saul. I've lived my whole life walking around in Saul's armor. But it doesn't fit. And maybe what this message was designed to do is to help you take off Saul's armor and take up your sling and your stone because you, you've been living a life, come on somebody, and you've been living a lie that somebody else, maybe even well-meaning, with good intentions, chose for you. And God says, if you're going to be free to be you, free to be me, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You've got to peel back that layer that you've been using to pad yourself all these years. God, <laughs> if God wants you, if that's you, and you've been living your life and allowing others to live their lives vicariously through you, this is what God says to you. Because I think sometimes when life comes and beats up at our confidence, we do what we need to do to find acceptance. I, I, did y'all hear what I said? When life comes and beats up on our confidence, erodes our confidence. We look for creative ways. We pad ourselves to find acceptance. And sometimes that acceptance comes when we acquiesce to what other people want for us, not what we want for ourselves. You know why? Because we don't have confidence. But if I acquiesce, then I'll have acceptance. But in the process, we trade who we were created to be for someone else's version of who we should be. Let me help you with confidence. Let me help you with confidence. Real biblical confidence never says... If I do this, they will like me. Real biblical confidence says, I'll be fine if they don't. Listen to me. You can no longer live your life wondering if people are going to like you or if they ain't going to like you. Listen, you ain't going to get 100% consensus about your choices you make, who you are, what you do. And your confidence can't be based on how many likes you get on your post. Your confidence has to be in the fact that I'm going to be me. Even if they don't like me. That's biblical confidence. And that's what David walked in. Not will they like me, but I'm going to be fine even if they don't. Here's a, I got three more, then I'm out of your way. Here's the next layer. Ha, you all ready for this one? It's the me in all of us. Uh, here it is. The me, I'm afraid God wants me to be. Woo-wee! ha, ha. The me, I'm afraid 
God wants me to be. This is the me in all of us that would rather justify why we are the way we are rather than embrace the change necessary to be our best for God. You said, Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm talking about Jonah. The version of Jonah that God wanted for Jonah was a prophet, an outspeaker for God, a man of God, in spite of his pain, who would be willing to ask God to be merciful on a city of 120,000 people who had been wicked and cruel to his own people. The me that I'm afraid God wants me to be is the me that God says, pray for your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. And even though Jonah was a prophet of God, he wanted God to destroy people that God wanted to forgive. The me God wants me to be will rub and go against the grain of everything that I justify, especially when my anger is justifiable because these Ninevites have mistreated my people. And you want me to pray for mercy? No, God, destroy them. I'm going to preach to them and tell them in three days, if y'all don't repent, God's going to send judgment. And what I really want is for them not to repent so that you can destroy them. And God says, no. I don't only want you to tell them of the imminent threat of judgment. I also want you to pray that their hearts would turn. And the scripture says, from the greatest to the least in the city of Nineveh, put on sackcloth and ashes and wept and repented before God. And God showed mercy to Nineveh. And guess what? Guess what Jonah, the man of God, did? He threw a hissy fit because he wanted God to destroy the people that he despised. But when we talk about the me that God wants me to be, let me tell you what that means. It means you will come to the realization that God loves people that you hate. Let that sink in, Converge Nation. You don't talk to them. You don't care for them. You avoid them. I'm talking about the me God wants you to be. But God says, no, baby. Those people you don't like, I love. And the me that God wants me to be says, God, this is hard. But the me that you want me to be forgives. The me that you want me to be shows mercy and kindness in places where I've been hurt and wounded. And that's one of the layers we despise. It is the me that God wants me to be. And God had to deal with Jonah's unforgiveness. He had to deal with Jonah's bitterness. And I wonder how many of us are not living free because we fight against the me that God wants me to be. Two more and then I'm out of your way. Heesh, here it is, the me that fails to be. The me that fails to me, the me that fails to be is the me that is plagued by self-sabotage. Where we become victims of our own decisions, our own choices, our own patterns, and our own habit forces. Yeah. Yeah. Take one step forward, ten steps back. Not because of what someone else did but because of seeds of self-sabotage. And instead of making progress, you're going in circles. The me that fails to be. 
Finally, finally, and most importantly, is the me that I'm meant to be. Yeah, the me that I was meant to be. The me I was created to be. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to get to, (laughs) y'all. The Holy Spirit wants to get down beneath all those layers and get down to the me that you were meant to be. How do I know that? John chapter 14 says that the work of the Holy Spirit, the helper, parakletos, would include leading and guiding us into all truth. Come on, somebody. And he doesn't only lead us and guide us into all truth about God, which he does, which is super important. Not only does he lead us and guide us into all truth about our circumstances, but he also leads us and guides us into all truth about ourselves. Truth matters. Truth matters. That's why in John chapter 8, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What's the connection with Holy Spirit and the truth and freedom and liberty? We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17 that the Lord is a spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But what does the spirit of the Lord do? He leads us and guides us into all truth. What does truth do? The truth we embrace and receive sets us free. So what is, what is the Holy Spirit doing right now in this moment in your heart? He is leading and guiding you into all truth about the me you were meant to be. The me you were created to be. He's peeling back all the layers to get down to the core of who you are. Because that's where God wants us to live. Psalm 51, as David repents, he says, you will cause me to know truth in the inward parts. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And this Independence Day, that's what God wants to get to. He wants to get to the truth about you, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Come on, somebody. That you are loved by God and that my soul knows very well that you are the apple of his eye, created for good works, which he prepared in advance that you should walk in. It only comes through the work of the Spirit in you. And so this is where we close today. The me I'm meant to be is the highest and best version of me that experiences life as God intended it to be the me I'm meant to be. It looks like John the Baptist, who looks like absolutely no other preacher in Jerusalem at the time. He's walking around, dressed in camel's hair, eating wild locust and honey. But that was the me John the Baptist was intended to be. Because God created you to stand out, not to fit in. And that's the version of you that God wants to resurrect and breathe new life into. This 4th of July weekend, this Independence Day weekend, God wants to remind you that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This is a ghost story that is being written in your life and is going to be transformational He will leave no trace of what you once were as you allow the Spirit of God to do the work. And here it is. You become what you behold. You become what you behold. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So in Isaiah chapter 6, and I promise you this is where we close, the Scripture says, In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah the prophet saw the Lord. He saw this revelation of God. He looked up. Listen to me. If you're going to have 
if you're going to be free, if you're going to be transformed, if you're going to become what you behold, you first have to look up and behold the Lord as he is. Something interesting happens, though, when Isaiah gets this revelation of the Lord, when he looked up and saw this reflection of God, it caused him to look in, and he says, woe is me, I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. The prophet, a man of unclean lips, the prophet, a man who was padding, who had layers, yeah, Because the Spirit of God will always lead us into all truth, not just about God, but even about ourselves. But he leads us into truth about ourselves, not to shame us, but to set us free. And so when Isaiah looks up and he has this God encounter, it causes him to look in. And he sees all these versions of Isaiah, the Isaiah with unclean lips. And guess what God does? He sends a seraph, an angel, and it touches Isaiah's lips with a coal, and he's purified. And here's the third thing that happens. Isaiah says, when God says to, 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 when God says, who will go for us and who will we send? Isaiah says, here am I. Send me. The same Isaiah who said he had unclean lips? Absolutely. You know Why? Because God had done a work of transformation in him. And now he was free to be himself. How does it happen? We allow the spirit of God to move our focus back upward to God. And when we see God for who he is, he will cause us to see us for who we are. And when we see ourselves for who we are in Christ, we will have the confidence to say, in spite of my past, in spite of where I've been, in spite of all I've done, here am I, send me, because I am free to be the me I was meant to be. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in Jesus' name. And God, we thank you for the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. God, we thank you for the chronicle of the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers in Scripture. Whether it was Moses or Saul or David or Esther or even Jonah that we reference today. But even more importantly, the chronicles of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I pray, God, that where we have been padding emotionally, unconsciously and subconsciously, where we've allowed ourselves to put on these fig leaves and layers. God, by your spirit, we ask that you would peel them back, peel them back, so we can get to the truth of who we are in Christ, who we were were created to be. And like Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. Use me as we become what we behold when we look upward, inward, so that we can look outward in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Listen, if that message was a blessing to you, we want to hear from you. Send us an email to echurch at weareconverge.com. That email again is echurch at weareconverge.com. We have some resources we want to send to you to help you jumpstart your relationship with God. We want to pray for you one-on-one and help you experience the fullness of what it means to be a Christ follower. Uh, We'll be back in person at 1611 Wilmoth Road. Listen, that's going to be Sunday, July 10th. Sunday, July 10th. But let me also say this. Our prayer, based on the timeline we've been given, is that on Friday, July 8th, and I need y'all to pray that there are no delays, no disruptions, Friday, July 8th, we will close on the building, and 1611 Wilmoth Road will officially be the new home of Converge Church. Now, this is what that means. Come on. Uh, We'll send an email blast out. We'll make the announcement. But what that means is, Whoever you are, wherever you are, if you can make it, 
to this building on Sunday, July 11th, you better be here because it is going to be a straight up, no holds barred. We're pulling out all the stops. We're going to celebrate the faithfulness and the goodness of God. If you've been tucked away in your house, you haven't been coming to church in person, no shade, no judgment. I just want to invite you to come back and be a part of that celebration on Sunday, July 10th. Now, it's not the official building dedication. We still got a lot of work to do. Our plan is to do a big building dedication in September. But listen to me, Sunday, July 10th, be in the building. Let's give thanks to God for this notable miracle that he has wrought in our presence on our behalf in Jesus' name. Listen, the announcer's gonna come as we are dismissed. We love you, God bless you, and we'll see you in person next Sunday, July 10th, right here at 1611 Wilmoth Road. Oh, we didn't take communion today, and I, that was intentional. We're gonna do that in person on July 10th. Hey, we love you, God bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his countenance toward you and give you peace. God bless you, Converge Nation. Happy July 4th. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless. If you were impacted by today's worship experience, we would love to hear from you. Maybe today's message was exactly what you needed to hear, or you prayed the prayer of salvation for the first time. If so, we would love to send you some materials to kickstart your relationship with God. Or if you would like more information on how to join our virtual family, email us at echurch at weareconverged.com. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can do so online safely and securely at www.weareconverged.com forward slash give. You can also give by texting 77977 and send Converge Give in the dollar amount. You can also find all of this information on our mobile app. Simply open your app or Play Store, search Converge Church Plano and download the app. It's that easy. Thank you again for joining us for today's worship experience. We look forward to staying connected with you.